So uh, we'll move straight on to our first talk. Uh, so it's uh, my great honour to introduce Natalie Frank, uh, who's a professor of mathematics in uh, Vassar, in the United States. She's come all the way over, actually, uh, via, from Alaska, via New York, <laughs> to, to be here today. Um, so Natalie did her PhD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, and she's now one of the central figures of the aperiodic tiling community uh, and the broader sort of area of maths. She's, uh, um, if, if you work in the field, you'll certainly know who she is. Uh, if you're a member of the public, uh, she's, uh, she's a great inspirational work uh, in the field. And it was great that she was uh, willing to come and give us a talk where she kind of introduces the general idea of what's, uh, what's so exciting about this branch of mathematics. She also uh, does a lot of her own work uh, that's uh, it's, it's kind of artistic outreach work and, and uh, has previously displayed various bits of artwork at, um, at different events. So she's uh, connected to the art community as well, uh, which is also well represented here. So uh, thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, I'll come to you. Too. Thanks, Felix. Um, it's a great honor to be here. I'm very, very excited to give you this lecture. And I'm going to really just tell you um, uh, the story of uh, what an aperiodic monotile is and why um, it has warranted this, this, this celebration here today and um, for months now in the mathematical community. So, um, all right, so I, oh, and I'm very open to questions. I will often seek them, so go ahead and just shout things out if you have uh, any questions for me as we go along. All right, so tiles, tilings, and the tiling problem. So I'm going to start by just what is a tile? Okay, so the most restrictive definition of a tile has been just a, de de um, a deformed copy of a square, let's say. So if you are a manufacturer of tiles, ceramic tiles for kitchens or bathrooms, uh, this is the definition for you. Um, and so I have three examples here, a pentagon, this janky little jaggedy shape, an actual square. That, that would be your most restrictive definition. And a, and a less restrictive definition would be any kind of closed set that has an inside to it. So it could have a hole, this red um, sort of square with a hole in it could be a tile, this, um, there could be a cut point like this, or it could be filled with holes that maybe would be filled in by another tile. Um, so those, those are sort of two extremes of what you might consider a tile to be. And here I'm, I'm exclusively going to be talking about tilings of the infinite Euclidean plane. Um, so. so a tiling is a collection of tiles that covers the plane uh, with no gaps and where the tiles themselves intersect only on their boundaries, at most on their boundaries. So here is an example, this is an Escher tiling. If you haven't seen the world of Escher tilings, you really should check it out, they're wonderful. But here there's two kinds of tiles. There's this sort of frog, you can see my cursor, yes. Um, there's this sort of frog, and then there's this sort of lizard, and their little legs interlock, and you can see that um, you could continue this pattern indefinitely to cover the entire plane. So two tile types, they come in several rotations. And this, this here is an example, I'll say more, but this is the first example I'm showing you of a periodic tiling. Um, so you could imagine taking this little frog right here and sliding him up and taking the whole tiling with him to this frog and the whole thing would, um, it would look exactly the same as when you start. So a prototile set is just a finite set of tiles. So here I've got a picture of a set of two tiles, two size triangles. Um, and so to make a tiling, you imagine that you've got an infinite um, supply of tiles from this prototile set, and you're going to put them together somehow or another to make a tiling of the plane. And so to make the tiling, you simply slide the tiles around. Maybe you can flip them over. Maybe you can rotate them. Um, and put them together to, to tile the plane. 
And so you can start with kind of innocuous questions. So if somebody gives you a prototile set, you could ask the question, can it make a tiling? Can it be used to form a tiling of the plane? So here, I figured I'd start with a really silly, dumb one. Can this, can this set of prototiles make a tiling of the plane? Yeah, you could probably think of about a million different ways that it could. Um, I chose this one. Um, a nice, another periodic tiling. So this, uh, pretend this gap at the top. I couldn't make that gap at the top go away no matter how I fought with the latex. So sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so, but you're supposed to imagine that going in all directions as an infinite checkerboard. And this is another example of a periodic tiling. If I picked this checkerboard up and slid it so that one of the green squares is on top of any other green square, then the whole tiling will look exactly the same as if I had not done that. Right? It's a nice periodic tiling. But of course, that's not the only way I could do it. You could imagine, you could imagine taking these tiles and each sort of column of tiles, you could imagine like just sliding it a little bit so it's not edge to edge and kind of making it a little janky all along. Um, and that would certainly be a perfectly good tiling as well. At, you know, you could use one green tile and the rest all white. See, there's many, many different ways. So, of course, that uh, prototile set can make a tiling. Can this prototile set form a tiling? And the answer is, again, yes. Um, at this, so here's, here's an example of a tiling that's not obviously periodic. It's very pretty. Um, it's kind of got these rings of blue tiles. So there's one here, here's a larger ring that's sort of interconnected with the other rings, and, and in the infinite tiling, um, because I know how I constructed it, I know that this particular infinite tiling will not be periodic because I know that these rings that form in my construction method, larger, arbitrarily large such rings will form, and uh, that will preclude the possibility of any periodicity. All right, so can this prototype make a tiling? Now the problem gets hard. Um, so you can see that perhaps it does and perhaps it doesn't, but this is a special tile that was discovered, what is it, 2021. Um, so I'm not going to go into the Heesh number too much. Um, but this is a tile that, so if you imagine taking this tile and trying to make a tiling with it, the first thing you might do is surround it with copies of itself. And if I surrounded it one time, that would be the first corona. And I could surround the surroundings, and that would be the second corona, and so forth. And I could keep going and try to see if I could make an infinite tiling. And as it turns out, you can't. Um, this particular tiling... So um, this I've taken, uh, uh, in many cases throughout this talk, I'm going to show you images from the actual paper. This, these, so these images are from the paper. Uh, this little white one in the middle is the central one, and it's surrounded. Um, and this one, it's, this, this is pretty cool on the right here. The gray tiles are the first corona. This is all the tiles that touch the white one. These beige tiles are the second corona. They're all the tiles that touch the first corona. The dark green is the third corona, and so forth. They're colored by coronas. And this, this tile has six coronas, and then that's it. You can't go further. You can't make a seventh corona. You cannot continue out to a tiling of the plane. And so you can imagine sitting there with copies of this tile and going and going and going, and how would you know whether it's an infinite tile makes it makes a tiling or not? It 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 sort of shows that this the tiling problem is very difficult. Um, and that was uh, <laughs> so the previous record holder was uh, was known to um, that, so the Heesh number is the number of coronas you can get out to, um, and so this tiling ha this tile has six coronas. And that's the current record holder. The prior record holder was five, obviously. Uh, it was discovered by Casey Mann in the 
it's like 2020 or 2000, I mean. Um, so maybe in 20 years we'll find a tile that has seven coronas. But not eight. Um, so what if there are tiles with arbitrarily large Heche number? Um, then it would be really hard to solve the tiling problem. It would be really hard to say whether any given set of prototiles tiles the plane. And also, what if, what if you had a set of prototiles where you could tile arbitrarily large regions of the plane, but, but those large regions couldn't be continued to infinite tilings? Um, these, these make the, the general tiling problem really hard to think about and to answer. All right, so what about this tile? So here's, um, here's a single tile. So a monotile, so I get to introduce one of the words. A monotile is a single tile that can form an infinite tiling of the plane. So this strangely shaped tile, this is from Heesh in the 30s and part, uh, partly in response to a, a Hilbert problem. Um, and the answer is that this, this one is a monotile. It can tile the plane. This is a, I stole this image from Wikipedia as it turns out, sorry. Um, and it can tile the plane. And as you can see, it's going to make a periodic tiling. If I take any blue copy, um, I can take any blue copy to any blue or green copy, and um, and the whole thing will be as if it had never been moved. All right. So here's here's a little collection of tiles. So are any of these monotiles? Are all of these monotiles? So if you take for instance, so let's start with the, the dumb one, this, this red one here. If I took this tile all by itself, can I make a tiling of the plane with just that tile? No, I mean, no, right, because it's always going to have a hole in the middle. Um, so that's not a monotile. Hexagon, can I use a hexagon to tile the whole plane? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Half of a hexagon is also fine because I can put it together to make a whole hexagon and then tile the plane that way. Pentagons, not, not so much. You cannot tile the plane just using pentagons. Um, much to the chagrin of many. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, and the hat, here's the hat, the first appearance of the hat in today's. And the hat is, in fact, a monotile. It turns out that it can, in fact, tile the plane. And it takes a little work to prove that, and I will not be doing that. Maybe Craig will do that later. You're gonna, no, Craig's not going to do it. Okay. Um, <laughs> you just have to read the paper. It's just a, a cool 60-some-odd pages. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> Uh, all right, so periodic tilings. I keep saying the word periodic. I haven't actually defined it. I don't know if defining it is properly going to help you, but a tiling is, is periodic if there's some vector in the plane where you can slide it by this vector and end up back the way, the way you were. So here's a nice hexagonal periodic tiling and, um, and what it means to be periodic. And just maybe I don't need to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you think of another thing that you know that's periodic is the sine wave. If you think of a sine wave, right, that has period 2 pi. Um, so if you imagine the sine wave as being made out of wire, you can pick it up, slide it over by 2 pi, and stick it right back on itself. Same idea. All right, so we've got the tiling problem, which is given a, given a set of prototiles, can it make a tiling? Um, and you can refine that a little bit. So if I have a set of prototiles, I could ask, can it make periodic tilings? And you could ask, can it make non-periodic tilings? There's lots of other questions you can also ask, but those two are particularly relevant here. So here's a, here's a tiling that 
when I practiced this talk, it was quite controversial, actually, <laughs> uh, whether I should use this. And I did. It was decided that I'm going to leave this, this one in the talk. So this is a tiling with half hexagons. The colors don't really matter, um, but they're there to help you see the orient with, with what orientation the, the half hex is happening in. And there's no obvious periodicity to this particular one. And I, I personally know, because I generated it and I know the generation scheme, that it's not periodic. And if you look, at, you know, you can kind of see where I'm coming from on that. Um, if you imagine taking one of these orange tiles, first off, since I'm only allowed to translate, it has to go to another orange tile for it to be periodic. Um, so if I was going to take this orange tile, uh, let's say, let's take this orange tile. All right, so it's connected to a long string of purples on the other side. So the smallest translation I could possibly give, well, I could try to, nope. All right, so you can already see that there's really nowhere I could move this orange tile within this frame. Well, actually, maybe. It just sort of depends what's here, but um, if I slide this up to here, well, I better hope that I've got a green one down here or else it's not going to be periodic. So, does anyone want to talk about this concept of periodicity at all? Or do we feel pretty good about it? Yeah. Yeah, if you have a tiling which you can't translate onto itself, mm -hmm. but you can rotate it 180 degrees onto itself, then that's aperiodic still? Um, it depends on the tiling. So some periodic tilings will have rotational symmetry like that. I mean, if you have one like that, how do we classify it? Do we classify it as aperiodic because it doesn't translate? We will call it non-periodic, yeah. Yeah, and maybe not aperiodic. Aperiodic, I'm going to use in a slightly more restricted sense than that. But yes, so other symmetries can happen even in the absence of periodicity. Yeah. All right, so I made this little table. I, I got this idea from Jim Prop. Um, but uh, so you can ask the question can the, you know, so given, so this, these are all single tiles. Can it tile periodically? So the square can tile periodically, and it can tile non-periodically. And the half hexagon can tile periodically and non-periodically uh, because of that image I just showed you. Um, if you believe that, well, you may, might believe my argument that it's not periodic. Um, from the, it was only a finite set, but finite view. But uh, let's see here. So the hexagon. By itself, the hexagon can tile periodically, but it can't tile non-periodically. The only way to stick hexagons together to make a tiling is the one I showed you. Um, and Heesha's tile is like that as well. Um, uh, all the, these three are non-tilers, so they can't tile periodically or non-periodically. And then the question of, are there tiles that can't tile periodically, but can tile non-periodically, right? There's this, this sort of mystery quadrant here that is the quadrant of interest. It's the quadrant where the, the hat falls. All right, so that's all I have to say about the tiling problem for now. Uh, we're going we're gonna to take it back to the domino problem, which is a simpler problem, sort of getting rid of all the geometry and reducing this to um, a much simpler case. So this goes back now um, to the 60s. So Hao Wang uh, was a logician, and he writes this paper in the 60s um, called Games, Logic, and Computers in Scientific American. It's a wonderful article. You should, I recommend you check it out, get it off JSTOR. Um, and this is his. The, the, this is the example that Wang has in this in this in this paper. Um, so instead of looking at any kind of sets of tiles, he's just going to look at square tiles that have their edges colored. Um, 
And so a Wang tile is a unit square with each edge colored. It looks to me like there are sort of five shades of gray here. And so this is a prototile set of three Wang tiles. And you can ask the question, can it form a tiling of the plane? And so if you have a finite set of Wang tiles, or he's calling them dominoes, even though they're only one O. Um, but, uh, so given a finite set of Wang dominoes, you could play a game. So he was sort of seeing this in the concept of playing a game, a game of dominoes. And you win this game if one of two things happens. So someone gives you, he gives you this set of three tiles. And you win if either you can form an infinite tiling or you can prove that no such tiling exists. And so in this particular set of three, he establishes that there is in fact a tiling because it makes a periodic tiling. So you can put the three tiles together in such a way that you make a fundamental block that the colors are the same along the top as on the bottom as, and the colors on the side are the same as the other side and then that fundamental unit can be repeated. And the purpose of asking it for setting up this game of dominoes is uh, Wang was interested in, in asking what can computers not do? What's beyond the scope of computation? And so he, pros he proposes the domino problem. So is there a general algorithm that can take, you feed it any set of Wang dominoes, and it spits out an answer, either yes, it can make a tiling, or no, it cannot make a tiling. Right? So can you write a single algorithm that can decide for any set of Wang dominoes whether or not it can tile? Um, and so he proposes this in terms of Turing machines, and I, I really don't have time to go into that today, but it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great article. I strongly recommend reading this article. Um, so if you can write such an algorithm, then the, the, um, the, ti the domino problem is said to be decidable. And if not, then it's undecidable. And decidability is sort of an indicator of complexity or maybe a lack of complexity. Um, so a problem that's undecidable, if you can't write an algorithm that can decide this question for every single possible tiling it, it's prototile set, then this is a highly complicated problem. And so decidability is a, is a whole class of questions that one sees in, in logic. So I believe at the time of the writing of this paper, um, he believed that it would be possible to write such an algorithm. But he was trying to determine how, you know, can, can we do this? And he reduces the problem down to saying that the, 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 tiling, the domino problem is decidable if and only if every set of Wang tiles that can tile the plane can make a periodic tiling of the plane. So his conjecture was that every valid set of Wang tiles could tile periodically. And so you can see how this would work. You, you could write an algorithm that would um, take a set of Wang tiles and stick them together and try to see if you could make a block where the colors along the top match the colors on the bottom and the colors on the side match the colors on the other <coughs> side because if you could always do that then as soon as you can then you know you have a periodic or you know you can make a periodic tiling and therefore you know you can make a tiling and so his his conjecture was that every valid set of wang tiles could tile periodically so a prototile set would be called aperiodic if it could tile the plane, but only non-periodically. And so Wang's conjecture was that there wouldn't be anything in this quadrant of my little chart. So 
<laughs> so Wang's conjecture becomes the domino problem is decidable if and only if aperiodic sets of Wang tiles do not exist. And as it turns out, there existed. Well, this is one of Wang's students almost immediately <laughs> proved him wrong that, um, that the, uh, and, and exhibited a set of 20,426 Wang dominoes that could make a tiling but could not make a periodic tiling. So this, this showed that the domino problem was undecidable, which meant that you could not write an algorithm to determine whether a given set of Wang tiles was, um, was able to tile or not. So there's no general algorithm that can determine this. Um, and so that's a lot of tiles, and I can't explain to you why that, is, why that, wor why that worked. Um, but soon thereafter, so then the, people were immediately interested in coming up with sets of tiles that could tile the plane but could not make periodic tilings of the plane. And so Robinson, um, Raphael Robinson, um, came up with several sets. Um, and this is from his Inventionis paper in 1971. Um, and this set of tiles, I can show you why it's not periodic, or I can try. Uh, so this is an aperiodic set of tiles. Um, so this is his original image. Um, but in order for me to show you, so you have these markings. So the idea is, um, so just to show how these arrows work. So um, here I've got the number of arrows has to match up. I mean, it's clear how the arrows work for matching, right? Um, so I could put this. Yes. So, so for instance, this tile could sit directly above this tile because the arrows go the same direction and there's the same number of them. Um, these two tiles could not be next to each other because the arrows point the opposite directions. Are you allowed to pick them up and rotate them? Yes, so in order, to, in order to use these, I think you need all the reflections and rotations. So there's the five basic tiles, but then you have all the reflections and rotations are also necessary. So it's, you know, it's something less than 40 total tiles are needed if you don't want to, if you want to count them all separately. All right, so I want to sort of, so this arrow scheme can produce tiling. So you follow those rules with these squares. You can produce a tiling, but every tiling you make will not be periodic. And I want to show you why. Because the argument here is the general argument that's been used, and it's the general argument that you use for the hat, um, which I will not be showing. OK, so I wrote my own version. I made my own little tiles. So, I, uh, so there's, there's this kind that comes in four rotations, and Robinson called these crosses. And they've got four, they've got four, all four sides go out. And so I'm going to use a shorthand. So this is, this is, this is the notation I'm going to use for a, a cross that I haven't decided which way it's facing yet. Um, and then arms are the ones that have a, a single one, three, three, three go in and one goes out. And I'm going to use this sort of shorthand for a, um, for an arm that I haven't decided how many. <coughs> I know which way it goes, but I don't know how many arrows are going where. Uh, OK, so, so you start with your set of five basic tiles, and you start trying to fit them together. And you play with them for a little while. You're going to discover that a 3 by 3 block like this is going to be forced. It's always forced by the. Um, so where you've got the four sort of corners facing in like this, and those are given, and then you have to put some kind of cross in the middle, and then these ones have to be arms. And so, but those choices are not guaranteed. And so if I make a choice, so suppose now I make a choice for the inside, then that's going to immediately force, now I know which arm goes here, because it's going to have to have two, 
and it's going to have to have two coming in on the side here and here. And so this arm is now forced, and this, this, all four of these arms are going to be forced. So, so once I make a decision in the middle of that one, that three by three block is completely forced. Um, so three by three blocks are forced by these arrows to occur like this. All right, and, and when you look at this three by three block, it's actually acting just like the middle one did. All right, so uh, as far as the outside is concerned, it's all out, right? So it's like a big cross. Everything is going out. And, um, and it's got two in the direction. It's sort of translated the, the, the sort of direction this one is going has now been translated to the edges of this outer three by three block. So it's sort of communicating um, its direction through. So once you, once you, you recognize these sorts of three by three blocks must form, then um, you realize these seven by seven blocks have to form. And so on the outside, you've got to have four of these ones. They have to be facing in. Um, and then you have this undetermined set of, you know, you've you got to stick a cross in the middle. The rest of them are going to be arms going out in all directions. And I think you can see how this is going to play out. Now, now um, I've got to, you know, suppose I make a decision on this middle one. <coughs> I chose that way. Um, and now these, the, the direction of this middle one is going to translate its way all the way to the edge. And this 7x7 seven seven block is going to act just like the cross in the middle. It has all the same properties. So it's sort of transmitting this information along. So even though the markings are, are small and local, you can see how they're um, transmitting the information into larger and larger blocks. So now we've got 7x7 seven seven blocks. And, um, and they have to look like this. And I think you're probably willing to believe me at this point now that these, these are going to fit together. We're going to need four of them on the corners. There'll be a big undetermined bit in the middle in a 15 by 15. And again, filling in the middle, the whole thing is going to go forever and ever. And so, That is the structure of any tiling that these tiles can make. So every tiling that these tiles can make is going to have this kind of uh, structure of these larger and larger crosses that occur. And that eliminates the possibility of periodicity. Because... Imagine, imagine that I had a, 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 a translation that would take, you know, so, so, so perhaps this is now a portion of an infinite time. Right? And we know, we know that this guy sits inside of a 15 by 15 block of some sort and so forth. So if I want to have a translation, so I need to take for instance, this three by three block will have to slide onto another three by three block. So already I can see that if I have a period, it's got to be more than, um, I would have to get all the way over to the next um, hunk of my 15 by 15 block. But if I did that, then this one, this green one, then my, so maybe I can get my three by three blocks to line up, but that might mess up now the seven by seven block. Because then the seven by seven block will be sitting partially on top of itself. And so no matter, so that means that my translation must have been larger than the, just the translation to match up the three by three. So if I try to match up the seven by sevens, I have to go further. 
but that will that will cause my 15 by 15s to be overlapping themselves illegally, um, which means that any translation would have to move the 15 by 15s onto themselves. But that would make the 31s by 31s offset improperly. And so you find uh, by this logic that um, the length by which you would have to translate would actually have to be infinite. So that's the argument for why this set of tiles cannot um, produce a periodic tiling. Does anyone want to talk about that a little more, or is it making sense? All right, cool. So, um, all right, so, so the tiling problem is hard. It's hard. We already know it's undecidable uh, because the existence of aperiodic set, tile sets has proved that... Um, <clears throat> that no, no Turing machine can be created that will produce, that, that can answer the question of whether it can tile or not. Uh, so we already knew the tiling is, problem is hard, but the, the tiling problem is hard for another reason that, was, that Dworkin and she um, proved in, in, um, in a 1995 paper. It's, it's, it's that if you have an aperiodic tile set, then you are guaranteed to have deceptions or defects um, where arbitrarily large regions can be tiled, but those regions that you've tiled can't be tiled the rest of the way to infinity. So you, have, um, you can make arbitrarily large patches of tiles that can't be continued to an infinite tiling of the plane. So it means that with an aperiodic set of tiles, although you can make a tiling, you're highly likely to make something that's not a tiling if you're just messing around. Um, and so the emergence of defects in quasi-crystal growth is unavoidable for all aperiodic tiling models in the plane with local matching rules and for many models. So this is, um, so the tiling problem is really hard. Can I ask, what, yeah. what's the difference between arbitrarily large and infinity? Mm. So arbitrarily large but finite, but still finite. Wait, wait. Mm. Does that offer you arbitrarily large integers? They are arbitrarily large integers, but there's not one infinity integer. Okay. No. Yes? May I just say that working in Shea is such a pain for us this afternoon when we try to simple hats and That's right. That's right. This is when you when you sit down with the hat tiles and try to make your tilings, you're gonna find out you're gonna find out the meaning of this green box <laughs> with your own hands. <laughs> yeah, this is um when you when you do this, if you go to if you've ever gone to a math museum and played with their Penrose tiles, you you quickly find out that you uh you're, uh, you better know the rules of the game, or you can't do it. Okay, so let's get to small aperiodic tile sets. How am I doing? I'm doing okay-ish. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we got, we've got that, that tile set had, um, let's say, five plus reflections and rotations. This is, this is one of Penrose's. I think it might have been one of his, for the first one, um, that he thought of. So this is from the, this, I've taken this from the Pentaplexity paper, which is a lovely little paper where he talks about um, kind of process that led to, 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 to making the fam famous Penrose tiles that you see outside. The Penrose ROMs are out there. But so you start with these six. So this is sort of an attempt to make a tiling out of a pentagon. And so you end up with three kinds of pentagons and then to fill the gaps, um, you need these other kinds, and then he's put these decorations on to force them to fit together. So instead of little arrows, using actual geometry. And you can make, I'm, I'm including this picture because I love it so much. Um, this is drawn by hand. 
And I want to know, <laughs> I said, what, I, mean, yeah, I will find out today, um, who, who drew it. Um, so you can see the little, so today we would do this on the computer, but this has been done with a pencil and a straight edge. It blows my mind. Um, and this, this argument that I made for the Robinson tiles, this argument is, can kind of be seen here as well. If you forget the little, um, if you forget all the bumps and dents, you see that sort of the pentagons, they group together into these sort of larger pentagons and, and diamonds and so forth. And those group into these larger pentagons and diamonds at this sort of same deal where you're seeing this superstructure being communicated at larger and larger scales is the thing that causes it to be non-periodic because one of these large pentagons if you were to have a periodicity it would have to slide onto another large pentagon which would cause problems with a pentagon at the next stage up and um, so just from a historic standpoint, there are two pairs of, there were two pairs discovered sort of in the 70s of, of um, aperiodic tiles, so Penrose's, and then I put the Amman ones in just because. And there's lots of other two-tile aperiodic tile sets. And so that was the 70s, and at the time we, we, we said, well, what about, what about one tile? Can you make a single tile that can only tile non-periodically? That's the Einstein, the one stone problem. And that was the Einstein problem. Is there a single tile that can be used to tile the plane such that no tiling it makes can be periodic? That is to say, is there an aperiodic monotile? And that was the Einstein problem. And that problem stood until March of this year, depending on your, depending on your perspective. So we'll, so, so, um, so is it an Einstein? So let's, let's play is it an Einstein? All right, so this is, so this is, this, so then people were really interested in this question, right? It's, it's, it's a cool question. There's lots of reasons to think about it. You know, what, what can you do? So here's, here's a sort of early-ish three-dimensional version. This is the Schmidt-Conway Danzer tile, which I, I took. This, this picture is from Danzer's um, paper on the subject. So it's a sort of a bi-prism type thing that forces layers and each layer. So each layer is periodic, but each layer is, is irrationally rotated relative to the previous one. And so you end up with this sort of screw symmetry in three dimensions. So in three dimensions, you have um, what some people think of as an Einstein and which other people think is a little bit of a lame a lame Einstein, but um, <laughs> but anyway, that's like we're not we're not in three dimensions today. Um, the, the, the closest we came, and this was very exciting, 2011, um, is this marked hexagon here. You need its reflection as well, but we can live with that, um, with these markings. So the rules for these markings are the black lines have to touch, um, and then these purple flags they don't control their immediate neighbor, they control one away. So if you've got this flag here, then you must have this flag here. That's the way these rules work. Um, and so you've got to, the black lines have to match up, and then if you're one edge away like this, then your little flags have to be um, pointing the same direction. So it's sort of a quantum. You're sort of um, you're sort of controlling not your immediate neighbor but one away. Um, and in this picture, you can see again that same sort of argument I showed you with the with the Robinson tiles. If you follow these rules and put the tiles together, the black lines form these triangles and the triangles form at larger and larger scales and so any finite translation there's going to be a large enough triangle that it doesn't line up on top of itself so again we see the same kind of argument 
showing non-periodicity. And so this is really exciting, and this is a, a great solution to the Einstein problem. Um, a, there were a couple of things that people didn't like about it. Uh, you need both reflections, okay, you know, to, to, you know, that can be an opinion. But the other, the other objection was that if you wanted to do it geometrically, so in the, um, you know, with little bumps and dents in the tiles instead of, instead of just m matching rules, then what you end up with is disconnected tiles. So this black tile in the middle has these little satellite pieces that also stick out um, that create, you know, that allow it to sort of interact with a tile that's sort of two away. Um, and so people, people were not, not everyone felt like this was a true solution to the Einstein problem because the geometric version was not, um, was not connected. And that brings us to the hat. The hat um, is a connected aperiodic monotile. Um, and it's the reason that we are here today. So starting in the 70s, bringing us to 2023, you know, good 50, a little 50 years later, no problem. Right. There's a picture of it. Now, I won't say more because Felix is standing up. Um, but I will say, oh, okay. I will show you this picture I took from probably the paper itself. Um, and it shows you that with the hat, they use the same kind of argument where the hats come together to form these little triangular type things that then fit into these large, you know, it's the same kind of thing. Craig's not going to teach it to us, but we'll, maybe you can just believe me. Um, and I must use Jim Propp's quote, uh, this innocent almost mundane shape, when forced to tile the entire plane, self-organizes into a communication network that disrupts periodic order at all scales. But maybe you don't like it because you needed to use both reflections. Well, we have a solution for that, apparently. <laughs> By May, so this could have been... Um, this could have been Spectre Fest, but unfortunately, the, the, you know, this is a hat fest. Um, so D David Smith wasn't done. He figured out how to do it without reflections. It's, it's, um, it's amazing. So you can, in fact, so this is a, a really nice solution. I think many of us are in agreement. This is a great solution to the Einstein problem. But I just want to congratulate congratulate the team for their work on this and humanity in general for our achievement. <laughs>Thanks very much, Natalie. Um, we have time for a few questions. Uh, Nick's going to try and run around with the microphone, um, if possible. We'll see how that goes, but otherwise just try to speak loudly. Uh, and Natalie will repeat the question back uh, so that uh, we can hear it. So are there any questions for Natalie on that lovely talk? Yes, there's uh, one there from Adolfo. It's going to run. Or you can shout. I can shout. <laughs> so I don't know much about the Einstein So you said you had an example of each number six, and so are all of them realized from like one, two, three, four, five, six, and do we know that there's some missing? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that we have tiles that have each numbers up to six, um, but yeah. If I might follow that up, is there it's any, this. is it at all obvious now how to use the Hartor Spectre to solve that? Huge number problem for larger finite numbers, or is that not? I don't think you can. So it won't because it ties. Hmm. And there's no sort of mod there's no attempt to modify it to get. Uh, so you can try gluing hats together. Right. And, and as soon as you glue two hats together, that unit doesn't tile anymore. But I tried it, and you don't get high page numbers; you get low page numbers. Hmm. So you don't break any record. Okay.
If you were really ambitious, you're like, maybe I can break another record with this thing. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, there's another question right there. That's very quick, and we'll go over. So just a very naive question. Is it known whether these aperiodic tilings of the same tile are different? Can you have different tilings? They're not related by some translation from one to the other. Um, can you say it again? Is it known if I make two aperiodic tilings using the same tile, is it known that they're different in the sense that there would be no way of translating or rotating one to end up with the other? Yeah, so, right. <clears throat> so there's a couple of answers to that. So there's, in some sense, there's infinitely many half tilings, and they're all non periodic, and they're all different. But the same, they all live together in a hull. There's a um, dynamical systems theory, which is the kind of work that I do. You actually consider all of the possible tilings given by a prototype set at once. And they're all different, but very, very highly similar to one another. So, yeah. Uh, maybe you want to go up to Mikhail at the back? He it wants looks to like he wants to reply. He wants to make a remark. <laughs> Time for one or two more questions mm -hmm. if you'd like a quick break in between. So there's one here. Nicky, able to get down? Or, or shout. Or just shout. Um, so, in your construction of the, some of these aperiodic tilings, you, you seem to start with something in the centre and work your way out. Is there always a sense in which there is a centre in an aperiodic, some arbitrary aperiodic tiling? And if there is a centre, is there some way of finding it? Somewhere else. There's some sense of direction. Right. So that's a good question. I mean, sort of no. Um, so there's not always the center, but there's always well, and there's not even always this hierarchical structure. Uh, but that has been the way that we've tended to find. There are. There's a whole nother way you can create aperiodic tile sets that more, that's more computational in nature. Um, but yeah, there's not always a center, but somehow locally there kind of is. It's, um, it's, it's a tough question for me to answer for you. <laughs> I, I think like, can I weigh on that? You've got these, these high particle tilings, you've got these patches with, this, with the center. That patch might be part of a bigger patch which has a different center. That's way over that part way. Of a bigger yeah. patch that has a different center. And if, you know, for drawing pictures, you, it's, it's nice to just use the same center over and over. You put one patch in the middle of the next one, in the middle of the next one, then in the middle of the next one. But a general one won't have a well defined center because the bigger and bigger patches have the center jumping farther and farther away from the, the origin and going to infinity and, and just. Which a kind typical of, one doesn't have a wealth mindset. Right. Which so kind of answers the question that was over there. Which kind of relates to what you were saying. Okay. Uh, I think uh, because we want, you know, in the interest of time, perhaps we'll uh, leave things there and there's plenty of time to ask questions at the coffee break after the next talk. So we do have a few minutes if you want to take a quick break uh, uh, before the next talk. But please uh, thank uh, Natalie, Reba, Frank, once more.